got to a stage where I didn't know how it was going to end. I was out on bail. My young son was out on bail. My other young son had been murdered. I thought, where's it all going to end? I want a normal life. So I said to young Jason, I'm going in there and I'm going to have to kill Dennis. So you actually seriously thought about killing your own yes, son? Yes, I did. I did. I was driven that far. To protect the others, I would have had to kill Dennis. Dennis Allen was a millionaire heroin dealer. He's believed to have committed up to 13 murders and reveled in the nickname Mr. Death. Allen would murder people in his own home in front of witnesses. His nephew, Jason Ryan, would later tell police about three murders he witnessed. Dennis grew up in a rough public housing estate called Olympic Village. It was built to house the athletes during Melbourne's Olympic Games in 1956, but soon degenerated into a ghetto and a petri dish for crime. Dennis wasn't Kathy's only problem child. Every one of her sons, including the youngest, Jamie, had an appetite for violence. So when you think of the, what became the uh, Allen, Pettingill, Pierce family, you have to think of a very dysfunctional unit, not, not a real family. It was kind of a primitive urban tribe, a crime gang bound by blood in more ways than one. Nephew Jason Ryan was one of Dennis's most trusted family members and witnessed three of his uncle's murders. Jason Ryan recalls the murder of Wayne Stanhope. Jason said it was his first that he witnessed at the hand of, of his uncle Dennis. Wayne was a so-called friend of Dennis Allen. Wayne Stanhope came out of Geelong Prison to visit me. I forgot to tell him that I didn't get on well with Dennis Allen. I should have said, because he didn't tell me he was going to go and visit Dennis Allen. And then when he left me, he goes up to see Dennis Allen. Then. And Dennis, and he goes into Dennis Allen's place at Stephen Street, Richmond. And Dennis said, where you been, uh, Wayne? He said, I've just come back from seeing, seeing Chopper. He said, Chopper Reed? He said, yeah. And he said, oh, again. Wayne Stanhope's got up to change his record. So Dennis Allen shot him in the back of the head with a 38. He did that because Wayne Stanhope came to visit me in Pentridge. And I, I bashed Dennis Allen in Pentridge with a, with a rolling pin. Allen was heavily addicted to speed. At the height of his drug taking, he was injecting a phenomenal seven grams of pure speed every day. That particular drug, unlike many other drugs, very quickly leads to a sense of psychosis. It does damage to the brain, it does damage to areas of the brain that are involved in problem solving, personality. He would have had frequent episodes of psychosis, mental instability, emotional instability, lack of emotional control. One, one occasion when Kathy came home from a massage parlor and Dennis used to line the bathroom with black plastic floor ceilings and walls, and he would take people into there and, and, and bash them senseless, and then he would go away and have a drink and um, stick some, some more methadone into his arm and then resume the bashing. And one night, Kathy came home and there was a barely conscious body lying in the hallway. Dennis and his soldiers were in the room watching television and drinking and injecting speed. They were waiting to finish him off, and Kathy got that boy out. Dennis liked to do his killing at home. He was a creature of habit, uh, you know. He, People used to say that he'd ring you up and ask you over to kill you. So there was numerous murders carried out in, 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 within his empire of, of, of properties in the uh, Cremorne area of uh, inner city Melbourne. Among the victims was one of Alan's dealers, a prostitute and junkie named Helga Wagner. Dennis became convinced she was ratting him out to the police. He lured her to his home, offering a taste of a new supply of heroin he'd just received. He knew Helga could not resist such an invitation. According to Jason Ryan, Dennis gave her a hot shot of heroin. Didn't quite kill her. Dennis then ordered Jason to run down to the nearby Yarra River with a bucket, come back with it full of the Yarra River water. Dennis then proceeded to pour that water down 
Helga Wagnick's throat. Jason recollects that she reminded him of a whale. She kept spitting the water out and wouldn't die very easily. Uh, apparently it took Dennis several attempts to actually drown her and then her body was thrown in the Yarra. As Melbourne's biggest heroin and amphetamine dealer, Alan wasn't short of money. He bought his headquarters, two houses in Stevenson Street, Cremorne, for cash. Soon he was buying more properties in the adjoining streets for his family members and foot soldiers. Residents soon complained of loud music, screaming and gunshots, day and night. Police began surveillance and set up their operations in the recently closed Rosella Soup Cannery nearby. There's a story about how he would get in these paranoid rages and walk out and ping a few shots at them as they were doing surveillance and other police were asked to, to ask Dan and please, Dennis, please don't shoot at the guys in the Rosella factory because they're only doing their job. And, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Because he was, he was a lover of police. Paradoxically, for a guy who, who, who was so on the other side of the law, he loved police, would always assist them. And Dennis Allen, when it suited him, would inform to the police to keep himself out of jail. He rang me one night and uh, oh, about midnight and he said, you better get over here. I've got a case full of fucking money. Well, he'd already rung another policeman, so we go over to his address in Richmond. We find this, uh, this fella handcuffed around a pole in his backyard, and we found a case full of forged shorty dollar notes. They're the kind of things that Dennis Allen would do. Uh, where he got the handcuffs from, I didn't ask him, but when we got there, our prisoner was there, and he took us around and showed us the various places where they had done the printing. He was clearly involved in several murders, but um, the amount of information he was giving to members of the breaking squad and the consorting squad on other people, the, the crooks that, uh, that he knew or was associated with, was incredible. There were times when you had one set of Victoria Police who were trying to load Dennis Allen up with a gun and another lot who were trying to cut them off and give Dennis a warning. Got to a ludicrous situation um, where he, he got bail in the most ridiculous circumstances, but uh, he was that useful to certain police. I mean, it, it got to the stage where he felt so untouchable that he hatched a plot to blow up a court, for instance. Still got bail. And there's absolutely no doubt, given the number of times that Dennis appeared in court on serious charges ranging from murder on down, and was granted bail time after time after time. And Quite often, the reason that he was granted bail was because a police officer stood in the dock and said, um, I, I support this man's application for bail. Their whole attitude was that Dennis is much more used to us on the outside as an informer um, and passing on information to us than if he stuck behind bars. However, Dennis Allen's days as a protected species were soon to end. And his greatest threat came not from the police or the underworld, but from himself. His drug-fueled lifestyle would eventually catch up with him. Before his death, the once terrifying psychopath was frail and wheelchair-bound. A rare heart condition and a lifetime of drug abuse had taken its toll. He was no longer a threat or a useful police informant. Witnesses once too scared to talk found their voices, and police who'd once protected him turned their backs. To me, he served a purpose. Uh, to a lot of people, he was just a drug dealer and a murderer, and, uh, and uh, he lived by the sword and he died by the same sword. He died of overdose of drugs and alcohol, and uh, he got his right whack. At the time of his death, aged just 35, he faced a total of more than 60 charges, ranging from possession of firearms and explosives right through to murder. <laughs> 